Good evening. Uh, I'm Laurel Trainer, and I'm the director of the McMaster Institute for Music and the Mind. And I'm delighted to welcome you to our fifth annual integrated lecture and concert. Uh, I'd just like to start by thanking the Mohawk, Mohawk Trio, who you heard on the, the way in, uh, for setting the stage for what's to come tonight. The McMaster Institute for Music and the Mind has three main goals. To promote research and music cognition, to promote music education for all children, and to promote music in the community. And I always enjoy our integrated lectures and concerts because they really bring all three themes together. Music has the power to move us emotionally. Music can take us from joy to the depths of despair. But have you ever wondered how it does this and why some music sounds sad and other music sounds happy? Our speaker tonight, David Huron from Ohio State University, has spent many years researching questions such as this and by the end of the evening, we will all know a lot more about why music moves us so profoundly. We also have several wonderful musicians tonight as well. Uh, so by the end of the evening, I hope that you will also have really felt the emotional power of music. After the lecture and concert, we invite you to join us for some refreshments in the lobby where you can chat with the musicians and with David Huron. Uh, but before we begin, I'm delighted to introduce the Provost of McMaster University, Dr. Eileen Bush Vishniak, and she will say a few words of welcome. Uh, she has been a great supporter of the Mus McMaster Institute for Music and the Mind. Eileen. Thank you, Laurel, and welcome, everyone. Good evening. It is a great pleasure to welcome you to the fifth integrated lecture and concert sponsored by the McMaster Institute for Music and the Mind. The McMaster Institute for Music and the Mind is a wonderful example of the excellence and innovation that defines McMaster University. Through this institute, McMaster has become one of the top centers in the world for the scientific study of music and we offer the only science undergraduate program in North America in the field of music cognition. This is also the only institute that I've ever seen at any university which has had research funding from the Grammy Institute. And I, Laurel's promised me that if she wins a Grammy, I get to go with. I would like to take this opportunity to congratulate the members of the McMaster Institute for Music and the Mind under the leadership of Laurel Trainer who were recently awarded $6 million from the federal and provincial governments to build a research center for music that will be unique in the world. I am particularly pleased that they were managed to achieve this funding, get this funding, in spite of having some riffraff listed among their collaborators. I believe my name was there as one of the people. Music is present every day in our lives, and it affects how we feel and how we interact with others. Through the pioneering research of people such as Dr. David Huron, we are beginning to understand how music accomplishes this. David Huron is professor in the School of Music and the Center for Cognitive Science at Ohio State University. Originally from Canada, Dr. Huron served for many years on the faculty of the University of Waterloo. David completed doctoral studies in musicology at the University of Nottingham in 1989. In addition to his laboratory-based research, he has also conducted field work in Micronesia related to studies of musical globalization. I'm very much looking forward to hearing David's talk and enjoying the wonderful music. The title of the talk this evening is Major and Minor, A Psychological History of Two Scales. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Huron. I feel a bit like a spaceman or something with all this uh, stuff on me. Well, um, La Scala, you will know, is a very famous opera house in Milan in Italy. But of course, Scala actually comes from the, uh, the Italian ladder or Latin, and from which we derive the word scale. And a scale is just an orderly set of pitches uh, used in the construction of music. So I'm going to talk about uh, a number of scales tonight, but primarily two scales, the major and the minor scale. There are different scales that are used in lots of different cultures. So for example, in Indonesia, they make use of pelog and slendro scales. In the case of Japan, the manyo and the, uh, the ritsu mode, uh, the Dorian, Phrygian, 
Lydian, Mixolydian, all these different uh, church modes that were used uh, in European culture in the Middle Ages. But around about 1600 or so in the history of Western music, we settled in on what we now think of as the major minor system, where we have two principal scales in the music that you're most familiar with. The scale, the word scale is these ordered set of pitches, but when the music is constructed within that, so you don't have to order them necessarily according to the scale, we just say that the music is in the major mode or in the minor mode. So that's how we use those terms um, musically. Um, Giuseppe Zarlino was a musician and an educator uh, who was probably one of the first people to describe the minor scale as sounding um, uh, rather sad compared with the major scale. I, he was also apparently not a very handsome looking fellow by the looks of that. <laughs> um, well, let's start off with some music because I think the best way to, to, to get a handle on these is to have some demonstrations of this. So I think we're going to start off with a piece by Wilhelm Fried, Friedemann Bach, one of uh, Bach's sons.
I'm not sure sad may be the right word to come into mind. It may be beautiful to begin with. I would have thought so. But very beautiful playing. Thank you. Um, so in a minor mode, now we can turn from there to uh, an example of the major mode. So. And this is going to require some audience participation. Yes, this whole concert is. We all know this song, so come on. Oh, a deer, a female deer, pray a drop of golden sun. Me, a name I call myself, for a long, long way to run. So, a needle pulling thread, la, it comes right after so. Tea, we drink with jam and bread, which brings us back to do, 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 do. Do, a deer, a female deer, ray, a drop of golden sun. Me, a name I call myself, for a long, long way to run. So, a needle pulling thread, la, it comes right after do. Maybe not quite the sublime, sublime to the ridiculous, but certainly fun. <laughs> Thank you, Margaret, really. really. OK, where does Do, Re, Mi uh, come from? In fact, what we're looking at is uh, a hymn that was, would have been very well known if you were living back uh, in the 1800s. This is a hymn to, uh, to St. Saint, uh, Saint John's. It goes something like, Ut que ant laxis resonare fibris. Mi regestorum, famuli tuorum, sove poluti, labire atum, sancte Johannes. That would have been very, very well known uh, roughly about 1,200 years ago. In fact, so well known that it would be very useful to use as a form of instruction for the notes of the scale. And here you can see that the first note, ut, which later on became the first, no, uh, first sound, do, for domine. But the other notes you can see, ut, re, mi, fa, so. This is where it came from. They, each of the beginnings of each of the phrases start on a note that was higher in the scale than the previous. And this was used as a form of instruction if you needed to know what the notes of the scale were. Okay. So major and minor. Happy, as I said, happy and sad may not be exactly the right kinds of descriptions. There are plenty of other ways of describing and much richer ways of describing some of the music that we've just heard uh, right now. But there's also some empirical research that suggests that it's not implausible to talk about these in terms of sad and happy. Heinlein, to my knowledge, is the first one who did an experimental study in 1928 where he played the same pieces and same passages in the major mode and the minor mode and then probed people in terms of how it was that they experienced it and showed that there is, in fact, a strong association for Western enculturated listeners to hear the minor mode as sounding somehow sad and, by contrast, to hear the major mode as sounding somewhat happy. In a more detailed study done later on in 1935 by Kate Hevner, she pursued this even further and was able to probe other kinds of qualities or other kinds of emotional uh, connotations that came out of the minor mode. So first and foremost, it was indeed strongly associated with sadness for Western enculturated listeners. But it was also associated with some of these other things, such as, if I can get this to work, mystery, weirdness, and seriousness. We're going to hear some examples a little bit later of some of these other kinds of connotations that happen with regard to the minor scale. So two questions we might want to address is, first of all, why is the minor scale associated with sadness? Is it purely an arbitrary association? And in particular, could we reverse it the other way around? Could we have imagined another culture in which the minor mode would have been associated with happiness and the major mode associated with sadness? Maybe it's just singing songs with sad lyrics in a particular mode that we then just become associated with that. We learn to always, have, whenever we hear that, we make these associations, and it, but it's purely arbitrary. In particular, why is the minor, mode, or minor scale not always associated with sadness? And we're going to hear some examples in just a moment about some of the ways in which the minor mode could be used, and it definitely doesn't sound happy. And on the other hand, we might hear the major mode in ways in which you might say, well, that's rather, rather sad. So 
let's now start getting into the meat of this uh, subject by talking about what is it about sounds that might make a sound sound sad. And the people who have done the most amount of research in this are people in speech. So in speech prosody, people have looked at what is it about a sad voice? What is it about the quality of voice that people say, oh, you know, when you pick up the phone and you're talking to a friend, you immediately know, Jill, there's something wrong. Can you tell me what's going on? You can detect it just in their voice. So what is it? that causes us to recognize sad voice. And there are six factors that are known from the research about speech prosody that are indicative of sad voice. And none of these will be a surprise to you. You're all experts at being able to identify sad voice. The first of these is a quiet voice. So when a person is sad, they speak quietly. They don't speak loudly. Secondly, they speak slower, so that they don't, they're not speaking as fast as I am right now. If I were sad, I would slow down and start speaking more like this. Low pitch, so the pitch of the voice also tends to drop with sad voice. Small pitch movements, so if a person is excited or happy, the pitch of the voice may go up and down and go all, the excursion of the voice goes quite considerably, whereas when you're sad, you tend to have more of a monotone voice in which the same pitch gets reiterated or a very small pitch uh, variant, variance there. Um, poor articulation is another aspect of this. Uh, in linguistic terms, you might call these things like centralized vowels, where uh, if we have vowels that are extreme vow vowels, like the vowel E and the vowel O, where you place the chin and the tongue in extreme positions, more centralized values would be vow uh, vowels would be things like a uh, and e uh, and so forth. And what happens when you're sad is you move to more towards more centralized vowels. So when you're saying the vowel e, for example, you're more likely to say it as e. And if you say o, oh, for example, you're more likely to say it as o. Oh. That is, you centralize, you move the chin into a more central position and the tongue into a more central position. Another thing that happens with the articulation is something called lenition, which means that you're less articulate with the t's and d's and so forth, and you tend to then be more sloppy. Well, this is all technical ways of saying what normally how we describe this to our friends and we say, well, when people are sad, the voice that t tends to mumble. So there's a kind of mumbling quality to the voice. And then um, the last of these is dark timbre. So the, t the timbre tends to become more filtered. You can hear it as sort of a darker sound to it instead of the brighter sound that you might, uh, you might hear. So let's take a look at each of these uh, six known factors with respect to speech and now apply them to the case of music. So. Um, the question is, does sad music exhibit these same features that we see in sad speech? And in my lab, over the last number of years, we've been doing uh, research specifically related to testing each of these components or factors in sad speech to find out whether sad music also exhibits these same qualities. So the first thing we can say is that, yes, indeed, music that people judge to be sad music is first and foremost quieter than other kinds of music. Secondly, sad music is indeed slower. So people slow down when they start playing uh, music that people or listeners are apt to judge as sad. Thirdly, sad music is lower in overall pitch. So if you just simply take, uh, for example, one of the things we did was we took a dictionary of musical themes. There's some 10,000 themes in this particular dictionary, which we have available online to us. And if you just simply take all of the pieces that are in the minor mode, and you just simply take them and just average the pitch and find out what the average pitch is, and you do the same thing with the major mode, you find a significantly lower average pitch, even when you compensate for the fact of the structure of the minor scale. So um, that's also true. Fourthly, sad music has smaller pitch movements. So the interval sizes in music that people judge to be sad don't have the same kind of excursion. They move rather small amounts instead of leaping all over. Sad music mumbles. Well, how on earth, remember we talked about um, sad speech having this sort of sloppy articulation, the centralized vowels, and this lenition that, that goes on. What on earth could that mean in the case of music? Well, there are different ways of understanding what we might think of as musical mumbling. Uh, one way in which you might have music that mumbles more is that there's things we call slurs in music, where you, you don't articulate, you don't, for example, when you're playing the flute, you don't tongue each note, you slur them all together. Um, and it is the case, in fact, that music that people judge to be sad has more slurring than music that, judge, that people uh, judge to be happy. Another is the use of what we call staccato. So staccato is when we detach the, the, the individual notes, and you find that more staccato is associated with happier sounding music, and less staccato occurs in the case of uh, less happy or uh, less happy or sadder music. Another way in which music might mumble, for example, um, is uh, simply to take on the piano, for example, there's something called the sostenuto pedal. Um, and if you just put that pedal down, well, I can just demonstrate that. If I just walk over to the piano and I do something like this, 
That's without the sostenuto pedal. If I press the pedal down, they all kind of blend together here. So the sostenuto pedal has a sort of way of kind of mushing the music together, and that might be a form of mumbling. Well, it turns out that if you just take, for example, uh, 104 movements from the Beethoven piano sonatas, and some of those are in the minor mode, and some of them are in the major mode, and we simply take out a ruler. We just simply take out a ruler, and we look at the notation, and we measure how much of the notation, the sostenuto pedal has been told to be pressed down, and you find there's a very significant association. The sostenuto pedal is used much more in minor music than it is in music in the major mode. So there's evidence that music, minor mode music mumbles more. Sixthly, sad music has a darker timbre. So let's, uh, we'll, we'll talk about that in a little bit more detail here. There's what I like to call the Steve Martin effect. <laughs> Um, Steve Martin is, of course, known as an actor, but before he was an actor, he was a stand-up comedian. And uh, as part of his comedy routine, how many people know that Steve Martin is also a really superb banjo player? Yeah, he's played with Bela uh, Fleck and uh, all sorts of, he's re released CDs of his banjo. He's a very good banjo player. And he used to use his banjo regularly in his stand-up comedy routines. And one of the classic things that he would say is, you just can't play sad music on the banjo. And uh, in our lab, we sort of looked at this and we thought, yeah, that's kind of true. You never hear sad music on the banjo. And what would sad music on a banjo sound like? And what is it about the instrument that makes it sort of ill-suited for playing uh, sad music? Well, one of these things has to do with the fact that the sustain on these notes isn't very long. If you were to pluck a string, for example, on a guitar, you might go boom. It takes a little while for it to finally decay. But if you pluck a banjo string, it might go blink. It doesn't. <laughs> It doesn't sustain for very long. And that means that if you're trying to play a melody like Happy Birthday, blink, 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 well, you kind of have to speed it up if you want to get any sort of sense of line, blink, 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 uh, because the notes are so short. Well, uh, so along with Mike Schutz, is Mike here tonight? There he is, back there, Mike. Uh, one of your new faculty members that just start, started this year or last year? This year, a new faculty member at, uh, 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 at McMaster and a wonderful, uh, wonderful musician and a wonderful scholar. You're very lucky to have uh, uh, Dr. Schutz with you. But uh, he's also a collaborator. <laughs> he worked on this, this paper with us. We decided that we would test the Steve Martin effect more formally by looking at two instruments that we thought were very similar to one another, the marimba and the xylophone. These are both wood uh, mallet percussion instruments, um, and most people would describe the marimba as having a rather darker timbre than the xylophone. So a very simple th study that we might do is to take a look at the repertoire for these two different instruments, and we might ask the question, well, what proportion of the repertoire for the marimba is written in the minor mode, and what proportion of the repertoire for the xylophone is written for the minor mode? And if it is the case that darker timbres tend to be associated with sadness, we would expect to see a difference here. Well, we didn't expect to see this difference. The the difference that we saw is that music for the marimba is 60% in the minor mode, and music for the xylophone, 6%. So there's a huge bias on the xylophone to play in the major mode compared to the minor mode, and this is related to these, we think is related to the darker timbre. Okay, let's go back and reconsider. Remember, I st one of the things that I said was that lower pitch is associated with sadness. So when you hear one of your friends talking and you hear that their pitch has dropped down, it's one of the cues that tells you that they're apt to be sad. Well, there's a problem here. And the problem is, if this were literally true, then shouldn't all men sound depressed <laughs> compared to women? <laughs> so isn't there a problem here? Why don't all men sound depressed? Hmm. So we thought we would investigate this matter. There's a potential alternative interpretation of all the speech prosody research. And so the other possible interpretation is that what if sadness is evoked by a pitch that's lower than normal? So somehow that if you pick up the telephone and you hear your friend speaking, you have some sort of sense, people have different ranges of their voice. So some people are sort of soprano or coloratura even, some people are altos, some people are tenors, some people are basses, that somehow the brain might be able to figure out where the tessitura, where the range of the voice normally sits. And that for that particular voice you hear, oh, it's lower than normal, that might be indicative of sadness. So the question is, is this also, first of all, is this true and can we measure this in the case of music? So what we did was an experiment in which we ask the question, what happens if we expose listeners to music in some novel scale for a period of time, 
and then ask them to judge the sadness of melodies in which one or more of the scale tones are lowered. That is, if we want to test the hypothesis that lower than normal pitch sounds sad, we first of all have to establish some sort of norm. We have to say, this is what the norm is going to be. So in this experiment that I'm about to describe, what we did was we established a unique norm for each of the listeners in our experiment. Everyone had a different norm. And then we manipulated uh, what was going on. So let me tell you a little bit about the experiment first of all. What's going to happen in this experiment is that uh, individual listeners are going to hear um, uh, melodies. And at the end of the melody, these are very short melodies, about 30 seconds in length, they're going to have to judge how sad the melody sounded. They're just judging how sad the melody sounded. Now, uh, a few odd things about this. What they're actually hearing are obscure Germanic folk songs. <laughs> Okay, so they don't know these songs, but, uh, but they're, they're really based on, on Germanic folk songs. The second thing is that the timbre that they're going to hear is not at all the sound of someone singing. It's, the se it's a, a very a sort of uh, gamelan-like sound. It sounds like an Indonesian, you know, these very clangorous sounding uh, bell-like sounds that you hear. So they sound very exotic. When you listen to these things, it sounds like the music from some other culture that you've never heard of. And then the third thing that we've done with these is that they're not hearing them in anything like the scale that they're used to. So for each individual participant, they're going to hear it in a random scale. And there are criteria for generating these random scale. But each of them is going to hear it in a, unique, in a unique scale. So then the question will be, will listeners hear lower than normal for whatever scale we've exposed them to as sounding sadder? So we're going to establish a norm by exposing the listen listener to that musical a novel scale. And when compared to that norm, we're going to ask them to judge the sadness of melodies in which they're either lowered tones or raised tones. And then the question is, will the melodies using the lower than normal scale be judged as sadder? So here's how we set it up. We used a computer to generate what we call a test scale. So there are strict criteria about how this is generated, but it bears no resemblance whatsoever to any of the scales that you're used to. So the step size are, are, are controlled and so on. There's no octave equivalence. There's a number of things. But they're pretty wacky sounding scales. So there's a test scale we generate. And then from this test scale, we randomly select one, two, or three pitches. And then we make modifications. In one case, we take those pitches and we raise them. In another case, we take those exact same pitches and we lower them. So we're going to have two derived scales here, the higher scale and the lower scale. And now what we're going to do is we're going to recruit two subjects, two experimental participants. One is going to listen to music only in the higher scale. They're going to listen to 15 minutes of music only in that scale. Then the other participant is going to listen to 15 minutes only in the lower scale. So both of them have been exposed to different different music. And now what happens is we have a test phase. And in the test phase now, all of the music is going to be in the test scale. And in fact, it's going to be exactly the same melodies that both people hear. Exactly the same timbres, exactly the same pitches, and so on. But one is going to hear the test items as sounding higher than what they had heard before. And the other is going to be hearing those same test items as sounding lower than what they heard before. So since they're only hearing exactly the same melodies, the only differences in judgments would have to do or could be attributed to, to the exposure phase, what they heard before they heard these test scales. So what happens when we do this? So now they're both judging the sadness of these identical melodies. And the question is, is the person who's hearing that lower than what they were exposed to hearing it as sadder? And the answer is, absolutely. That's exa exactly what happens. Each of these subjects are all hearing unique scales. But when we lower the pitches compared to their exposure, they hear the sound as sounding sadder. OK, so what's the difference then in Western music between the major scale and the minor scale? Well, first of all, the thing to say about the major scale is that most of the listening we do in Western society is in the major scale. Depending on the genre, it's between 65 and 75% of the music that you listen to is in the major scale. There's a good reason why it's called the major scale. The minor scale is derivative of that scale. And it's diff what, how it differs is that either two or three of the pitches of the scale have been lowered. They've been lowered in pitch. So the minor scale is just basically a version of the major scale with just a couple of the pitches that have been lowered. OK. Wait a minute. The minor mode is not associated with sadness in much traditional Middle Eastern music and in music in the Balkans. So this is not true all over the world. Not everybody hears what we think of as the minor scale as sounding sad. And we're going to hear an illustration. In fact, we're going to hear an illustration right now. 
The first one is a recruiting song, and uh, it details what a wonderful, easy, and adventurous life the soldiers have once they actually join the army. And then the second one is a drinking song, saying that we can't get enough wine, and um, if you're not drinking, there is something very wrong with you. I love Eszik, iszik a sátorban, semmire sincs gondja. Hey, élet, begyöngy élet, ennél szebb sem lehet. Csak az jöjjön katonának, aki ilyet szeret. Pari pályát megforgatja, úgy megyen dolgára. Csillog, villog a mezőben, virág számodjára. Hey, élet, begyöngy élet, ennél szebb sem lehet, csak az jöjjön katonának, aki ilyet szeret. Tele hasztal, tele pohár, tele tál, kinek tetszik egy égig, te mindjárt. Azt mondta az öreg kis, ne csak együnk, ígyunk is, ígyunk is. Házi gazda bort ide a kupába, add igyék itt minden vendég bujába. Azt mondta az öreg nagy, ha nem iszol, bolond vagy, bolond vagy. Thank you so much, Margaret. If Margaret hadn't told you what the words were about, how many would have thought you were hearing something that was like a lament? Did it sound sad to your ears? Yes. Right? Did not sound like drinking songs? And the, if you're not drinking up here, you're, you're spoiling the party? Yeah. How many thought that maybe a, a good apt description might be bittersweet, even? Right, okay. Notice how it's very po possible to have music in the minor mode that sounds very different. Well, now we're going to hear something uh, in the minor mode. Again, this is now Western, uh, uh, Western European Germanic music. Even though that was in the minor mode, you might already now be identifying some of the acoustic features which don't make it sound sad. So remember our six factors here? So you'll notice, first of all, that the instruments are rather high in pitch. The flutes are not low in pitch, so that lends a kind of colorful quality to it. Secondly, you would not describe the, the sounds as dark. They're rather bright-sounding uh, timbres. And notice that the intervals here, they were jumping, doing quite a bit of leaping around and so forth. And then, for example, in terms of articulation, a lot of staccato notes and not so much slurring and so on. So even though the pieces were in the minor mode, they had a lot of the elements of, that we would, in speech prosody, recognize as not 
being sad. So that's, we can see that in, in that particular case. Thank you so much. OK, so let's talk a little bit more about the Balkan exception here. This notion that at least, and normally where this, this argument happens most in, uh, in ethnomusicological circles um, relates to Bulgarian music. Because in Bulgarian music, it's the best documented case in which you find music in the, what we would think of as the harmonic minor mode that's clearly not sad. You can find that, in, for example, in terms of the lyrics and so on. So. Um, the minor mode is not associated with sadness in much of tradi tradi traditional Middle Eastern and Balkan music. But notice, the major mode is not the preeminent mode in these particular cultures. So I remember the day when I phoned up uh, Tim Rice at UC University uh, UC UCLA, who is the major Bulgarian music expert. And I said, Tim, can you tell me what kinds of scales are used in traditional Bulgarian music? And so he told me there are four scales that are used in traditional Bulgarian music. But the major scale is not one of them. In fact, the, what we think of as the harmonic minor scale is the most commonly used scale in traditional Bulgarian music. So if we think of the major mode, which in Place, places like Hamilton, Ontario, it will account for uh, the majority of the music listening that you experience compared to other parts of the world. It is the norm. It is the way in which you're expecting. In fact, we've shown this in our laboratory studies that even if you just hear a single note, listeners from uh, at least from central Ohio, and I presume that Ontario is the same, uh, will assume that the piece of music is in the major mode. It's only when they find con contradicting e uh, evidence that they will switch over and hear the piece in the minor mode. Sadness is apparent only for listeners enculturated to the Western mode uh, norm. For many Western enculturated listeners, hearing nominally happy music from the Balkan region exhibits a tinge of sadness that is often experienced as bittersweet. So we'll hear music in a, literally in a different way than people from within that culture will hear it. OK, what cross-cultural evidence do we have in support of this? So we've done some work with North Indian rags. This is one of my former postdocs, uh, Parag Chordia, who is, in fact, a North Indian Hindustani music expert. And he did a study that was web-based in which he played, uh, I won't go into the details about uh, the structure of, West, uh, of North Indian music, but they make use of these mm, uh, scale-like or melodic-like things called rags. And in some of these rags, they change the pitches in various ways. And on the web, he, he provided excerpts of rags using uh, of these different rags, and then asked people all over the world who joined in on, on this website to rate the emotion, not just in terms of sadness, but all sorts of other descriptors for these particular uh, rags. So what he found, in fact, uh, over 500 participants, over 22,000 responses to all of these different things. And what we found was, in fact, that the, the rags that had the most number of lowered pitches were the ones that were judged most sad. And then the most important thing of, of, of all was that some of the people who went to this website were familiar with um, Hindustani music. Some of them were m modestly familiar. Some of them were experts, and m some people had no experience whatsoever. The people for whom the biggest effect size, that is when you lowered one or another of the pitches, who had the greatest effect of claiming that it sounded much sadder, were in fact the people who were most familiar with North Indian Hindustani music. So their experience of the music also contributed to, to that. OK, so there's another problem here. In speech research, lower pitch is not just associated with sadness. So if you happen to be a speech researcher in here, you'll know that there's something else that's associated with, sad, with, with low pitch. And that is, it's also associated with aggression. So uh, when we want to speak assertively or seriously, we also lower the pitch of our voice. We drop it down and we sound aggressive, we sound assertive, we sound uh, domineering. In fact, we've also shown that in my laboratory in the case of music. Is it the case that when you transpose uh, musical works down, what, what's the major effect? Yes, in fact, the major effect of transposing musical works down is that they start sounding more aggressive, more domineering. In fact, it also has the opposite effect. Uh, uh, one of the, my favorite experiments, we, when we did transpositions, one of the forms of the task was people had to judge how polite a melody was. <laughs> how polite is this melody? And by the way, what happens all over the world, speech people have documented this, is that when we want to speak assertively, we lower the pitch of our voice. And when we want to be approachable and polite, we raise the pitch of our voice. And we're being friendly, we do that. And that's also what happens in the case of music. When you transpose the same musical work up, people will say, oh, it sounds more polite. It's more friendly. OK, so what's going on? How is it possible that lower pitch can be sadder, but it can also be more aggressive? What's going on here? Well, 
an ethologist. In fact, uh, Eugene Morton, I believe, is just uh, down the way here at York University. Uh, he's an ethologist, which is an, a, an animal behavior specialist, and he works in acoustic signaling. What kinds of sounds do animals make? And he did a, a beautiful study, a cross-cultural, uh, pr a cross-species study. He looked at more than 50 species of the kinds of signals that they use and what the signals are used for. And what he found was that, in general, low is associated with aggression and high is associated with submissiveness. Well, one of the best generalizations you can make in acoustics is that large resonant cavities or massive vibrating objects will produce lower overall pitch or lower acoustic resonance. And that the smaller the size of this, either the acoustic resonator or the mass of whatever it is that's vibrating, it will be higher in, higher in overall pitch. And one of the ways in which we try to form an aggression is signaled throughout the animal kingdom is to try to make yourself look bigger. So the cat will arch its back, it'll make its hair stand up on end, uh, all sorts of animals will loom to try to make themselves look bigger. These are all visual signals signals are visual cues of aggression, but they're also auditory cues. And so when you lower the pitch of your voice, what you're basically doing is sending a signal, I'm big. Okay? And notice that for men who have the most dramatic change of voice, it happens at puberty, precisely the time at which men become sexually competitive. That's the time in which it's possible to make a truly aggressive or assertive kind of sound that happens. Okay, so there are some exceptions to this. So, High pitch is also associated with fear or alarm. So animals, when they're alarmed or fearful, will also make, tend to make high pitches. So it's not just associated with appeasement or friendliness. And of course, we've already talked about the research that shows in speech that low pitch is associated with sadness. So how do we make sense of all of this? So a few years ago, I proposed what I call my ethological model. And this is what my ethological model looks like. Basically, we distinguish high pitch, low pitch, and quiet and loud. When it's quiet and high, it signals submissiveness or politeness. When it's quiet and low, it signals sadness or sleepiness. When it's high and loud, it signals alarm or fear. And when it's loud and low, it signals aggression or uh, seriousness. OK, so let's, <laughs> let's then take a look at how this might actually have an influence on some real music. So what we're going to look at is a piece of music. Um, Brett is going to play it for us here. This is uh, Beethoven's uh, Opus 13, the Sonata Number no. 8, very well-known piece called The Pathetique. Now what's interesting about this piano sonata is that normally what happens in a piano sonata, there are typically three movements. You have a sort of fast um, first movement. Uh, you have a very slow sort of lyrical second movement that's often sad. And the third movement's often really very, very fast of, of some sort. We're going to hear just the first two movements, but what Beethoven does in this particular piece is he reverses the normal thing that you do. So normally what you do is you have a major mode first movement that's energetic and fast and perhaps happy. The second movement then is often in the minor mode and it's slow and sad and so forth. So we're gonna, let's just start off with the, the, with the very beginning. Can you just play the first couple of bars of the, of the, the second movement? Okay, that, that's just, that's great. Okay, so uh, how many are familiar with this piece? This is a pretty familiar piece. So it's in the major mode, but it's not what you'd call sort of happy. It doesn't sort of whack you over the head and say, I'm, I'm happy. Now, notice that many of the features we've been talking about, it is slow, right, and it's rather quiet sounding. So now maybe, maybe sadness isn't quite the right word here. Maybe a word like tenderness might be something that's more descriptive of what's going on here. But notice that in general it's low and slow. Now later on he reintroduces the theme. Just a few, Can you play that next section when he introduces it? Great. With the triplets? Yeah. That's great. Now notice here he's moved into the minor here, so it's, it's now starting, starting to sound a little bit sadder. But notice also that the, that the speed of it seems to have picked up. So it's almost as though he's kind of pushing back in one way by speeding it up at the same time that he's moved into the minor mode. So there's an element of this that makes it sound sadder because of the minor mode, but at the same time by using those triplet repeating figures, he kind of, kind of speeds it up so it doesn't have the same sort of slower feel to it. Now later on, um, there's a couple of other places where he plays it, but he does, does it with the octaves. Do you want to play that for us, Brett? Great. And now notice it's much higher here. So it's starting to sound a little more fuller and even in some ways uh, 
I mean, you wouldn't say joyous, but sort of, I don't quite know what the word is, but it, it starts sounding more appealing. Or, um, uh, what's optimistic. More optimistic, yes. Thank you very much. Look, what did you say? Grandeur. Grandeur, yes. There's a grandeur to it, too. He opens it up here. That's, this, is, this is also. Now, let's com contrast that to what he does in the first movement. So now in the first movement, it's going to definitely be in the minor mode. But listen to the very first chord of the first movement. Okay, now, <laughs> now, now no one would claim that. <laughs> no one would claim that that sounds sad. If we had to describe that, looking at our model here, it really sort of sounds serious. Doesn't it sound serious? It's as though Beethoven is saying, mm, "Yes, he's serious." Well, but then what does he do next with this? So continue on from there. Especially those quieter moments, Thank you. It, it almost sort of sounds sneaky. Doesn't it sound sort of sneaky? He's going to do this sneaky thing here. There's a little bit of weirdness to it. Too. And he, there's also those interjections which say, ah, but I'm serious. <laughs> sneaky. Sneaky. <laughs> serious. Sneaky. So forth. OK. So he's playing around with these dynamics there with that minor mode. <laughs> And it may not be sadness that you hear here, but notice that it fits in with the ethological model that we can start saying, oh, there's a kind of serious, maybe even an element of aggression to this that's, a, that's appropriate. But certainly um, what we might mean by aggression when you lower the pitch of your voice, when you go to, uh, um, to Sears or something like that and you have a complaint here, you'll, you know, you, <laughs> you, at least you can signal to the person behind the desk that, yeah, I'm serious about this. No, really, I don't care. No, no, I'm serious about this. So, Okay, so let's hear, let's hear the, the whole of the, first mo uh, the second movement. That would be great.
this is one of those rare moments where you get to, to applaud between movements here, since we're doing all the movements <laughs> out of. Uh, out of. Uh, what I want to draw attention to about the first movement is that there's an introduction, which is very, you'll hear the slow parts, there's very serious part, and then it'll break into a rather fast thing, all in the minor mode. And listen to all of these incredible subtle shades that happen in terms of the emotional qualities that you can hear. Keeping in mind things like articulation, things like timbre, things like tempo, and so forth. <laughs>
it's, it's one thing to prepare a, a lecture. It's another thing to prepare a wonderful piece of music. It's really delightful. Thank you so much. It's intermission. fine playing there and you heard some of the not just the sadness maybe some of the melancholy but uh, perhaps also some of the exotic and mysterious things that uh, Kate Heavener described related to the minor well 
this is just a reminder about the different factors that we've talked about in speech prosody that are indicative of sad voice. Let's just spend a little bit of time focusing on one more uh, of these particular features, specifically small pitch movement. So in music, we refer to the distance between two pitches as the interval size. So looking for small interval sizes would be characteristic of what we would expect to see in the case of music and sadness. So what we might do is consider an arbitrary scale. Let's imagine we had some sort of scale in some culture or some system, and we were asked ask the question as an abstraction, if we had to modify one of these pitches, what of these pitches, we've already talked about modifying pitches by lowering them so that, the, that these lower than normal pitches would ev evoke sadness. But now let's focus in on the relationship between the pitches. That is, what would happen to the interval size if we moved some of these? Now you can see in this hypothetical case, if we took one of these pitches and we shifted it, and we ask the abstract question, what will happen to the intervals, that is, to the distance between that pitch and some of the other pitches or the other pitches in the scale? You could see from this illustration that on the one hand, when we raise this one pitch, some of the intervals, the ones off to the right, would be smaller. But the intervals that that note forms with some of the other pitches to, to the left would be larger. So it's not clear a priori whether we made any modification to any scale by moving a pitch, whether we would end up on average with larger pitch intervals or smaller pitch intervals. So in, case, in this case, if all scale pitches and pitch transitions were equally probable, then modifying a scale tone would have little effect on the average interval size. But in the case of real music, this isn't the case. Scale tones do differ. Some of the scale tones in music, like do and so, are very common. And other, some, uh, others of the pitches, like la, for example, are much less common. And some of the pitch transitions, like the transition between re and mi, is very common. But the, the transition between la and ti, for example, is much less common. So uh, scale tones, since we do have these differences here, it's theoretically possible that by modifying one of the pitches, we may actually increase or decrease the average interval size over the course of an entire melody. So we might uh, talk then about a particular study I did with one of my students, Matt Davis, where we took 100 of the most commonly known melodies in a major mode. So this is things like Happy Birthday and Frosty the Snowman. In fact, uh, virtually all of the 100 tunes that we, we selected, virtually everybody in this room would know these particular tunes that we're talking about. Very common tunes all in the major mode. Now what we can do for any given tune is we can simply tally up the distance between all of the successive pitches and divide in such a way that we can find out what the average interval size is for that entire melody. So it may turn out to be the case that for say Frosty the Snowman, the average pitch interval is say 3.6 semitones or something like that. And then say somewhere over the rainbow, maybe it's larger, maybe it's 3.1 semitones or something like that. Now then we can ask the question, so remember we've got our scale here, do, re, mi, fa, so, la, ti. We could take any one of those tones and we might modify them. So we might raise it a semitone, for example, or we might lower it a semitone. And so let's ask the abstract question. If we took do, for example, and we were to raise it by one semitone, and we did that for all of the 100 of the songs that we did, and now for each of them we recalculate with the average interval size. And we ask the question, what happens to the average interval size? Does it get bigger? Does it get smaller? Okay, so we systematically raised and lowered each of the scale tones by one semitone. We tallied whether the average melodic interval size increased or decreased for each of the individual pieces that we had in our, da in our uh, database. So since there are seven tones in the scale, do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, ti, and let's imagine we moved them up one semitone. We could modify them by moving them all up one semitone or modifying them by moving them down one semitone. Some of the th uh, modifications won't make much sense. So for example, if we go up a semitone from mi, it's exactly the same pitch as fa. If we go down a semitone from do, it's the same pitch as t. So some of them don't make much sense. And of course, if we were to make larger changes, instead of making a one semitone change, we made two semitone changes, we would aggravate this problem of uh, essentially reducing the number of tones in the scale. So there are only certain tones that we're interested in. So what happens when we do this? So let me spend a moment to explain this graph because it's a little bit complicated. Um, now, what you're seeing here are plotted the number of uh, um, the number of tunes, the number of songs in which 
uh, when you make this modification, the intervals get smaller on average or the intervals get bigger. But in this graph, it's here just the, the intervals that are smaller. What we're looking for is values above 50. So around about 50, it means that it's having little effect when you're changing. Some of them get bigger, some of them get smaller in terms of these things. The bars that are in the red mean we've made a modification by lowering a pitch. The modifications in the blue means that we've uh, increased this by one semitone. And then the numbers here relate to the different scale tones. The first scale tone are Do, the second scale tone are Re, Mi, Fa, So, and so on. So what we're looking for is large bars, bars that go up. This says, if you modify me in this way, the effect I'll have is that for a large number of these songs, I will reduce the overall average interval size. And remember, reducing the average pitch excursion is associated with sadness. Well, you can see here that there are two significant bars that are poking way up above these. These are the modifications, which if you modified these tunes by making this change to the scale, it would have the largest impact of reducing the average interval size. And the scale modifications that are occurring here are reducing the sixth scale degree by one semitone, and the second best thing that you could do is to reduce the third scale tone um, by one semitone. And in fact, when you do that, what do you end up with? the minor scale. It's exactly those modifications which cause, uh, which are associated with the difference between the major and the minor scale. But in this case, what we've showed mathematically is that this is the optimum thing that you could do for the kinds of common tunes that we're exposed to in everyday life. The best way in which you could reduce the average interval size is first of all, by lowering the sixth scale degree, and secondly, by lowering the third scale degree. Now notice we could do the same thing, but instead of making one, change, we could start making two changes. And notice that what happens now is they start interacting. If we make this change and we make also this change, so for example, if we say lower the second scale degree and raise the fifth scale degree, those two will interact. They'll all have an, an, a, com a combinatorial interaction that happens there. So it doesn't necessarily mean that scale degree three and six will be the ones that are the most important once you choose to make two modifications. So, which modifications of two pitches would most reduce the average interval size for common major mode um, uh, songs. Now there are 86 possibilities because of this combinatorial exposure. Instead of taking seven tones and either raising them or lowering them for something like 14 different combinations, we now have 84 possibilities. So what happens when we run a computer simulation with all these 84 possibilities of making all these combinations of changes to the scale, which are, is the best way of modifying the scale? And the answer is, oh, I've already given it here. The best combination is to lower third, the third scale degree and the sixth scale degree. So it's the best of the two combinations. The second best is to lower the second and third scale tones. The third best is to lower the sixth and seventh scale tones. The fourth best is to lower the fifth and sixth scale tones. Okay, so now, when we start talking about lowering the fifth scale tone, in particular in combinations with things like the sixth, the seventh, and the third, we move into a new kind of scale that has become much more popular in the last hundred years, and that is some of the scales that are used in jazz, namely the blues scale. And we have a group that's going to actually do some improvisation around this. So are, are, we, are we all set up, Darcy? Um, I th since this is improvised, I can't tell you much about that. <laughs> about the music, but we can say that you're going to explore, I think, some of this space in terms of um, if you play loud and low, we probably should hear that as a bit on the aggressive side. If you play uh, rather quietly and low, it should sound on the more sad side. And, well, we'll work you'll work on that. <laughs> and, and most of all, you know, hopefully you're gonna, you're gonna play in the, in the edges here. Right there. Great, okay. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
as a researcher that you've got a handle on something and you've really started to understand it, there's nothing like listening to some great music to realize just how little you know. <laughs> okay, so let's review some of the experimental results that suggest that lower than normal is sadder. If the major scale is considered the norm, then there are a number of pitches which we might lower. If we lower three and six, we might end up with a harmonic minor scale. If we lower three, six, and seven, we might end up with what's called the natural minor scale. If we lower three and we add five into that mix, we end up with, ver with various blues scales. There appears to be nothing inherently sad about the Western minor scale. It appears to be the contrast between the major scale as a norm that f acts as a foil that the minor scale then uh, we attribute sadness to this. When the sound, sound is loud, lower than normal pitch is also linked to the perception of aggression. The musical connotations of high, low, loud, and quiet appear to be consistent with cross-species signaling and animal behavior. Of course, there's a cultural context here and really we have to do a whole lot more research in other cultures in order to establish whether these principles in fact hold. And uh, we do have some collaborators and we are pursuing uh, some studies, experimental studies in Japan and in India as well. So now, the, although it says part two, I don't want to scare you by thinking that we're halfway through. <laughs> We're very close to the end here. Um, but it is the, it, we are now going to address the question of why do listeners enjoy sad music? So before I do this, I, I coined this word epistophobia, which is <laughs> fear, of, fear of knowing. Attempts to account for sublime experiences will inevitably dis be disappointing because they seem to trivialize what we, what we experience as very profound experiences. And some phenomena may indeed be simply too precious to probe. Yet there may be rewards in attempting to trace the story behind one of music's deepest emotions here. So console yourself with, like any theory, the likely story that I'm telling here is probably just simply wrong. Uh, so if you don't like my account, you can console yourself uh, with that. Um, it's not very well known, but Oscar Wilde, apart from, from being a literary critic, uh, was also an amateur pianist. There's a wonderful quote uh, from the critic as an artist where he says, after playing Chopin, I feel as if I had been weeping over sins I hadn't committed and mourning over tragedies that were not my own. 
So in terms of sad music, one of the things that in our research we've discovered is that only about half of the general population enjoys listening to sad music. So this is a very selected audience that showed up tonight, if you, li if you're <laughs> like, if you enjoy sad music. As one of our informants said, I never listen to sad music because it makes me feel like committing suicide. <laughs> okay. Sometimes sad music leads to incipient or overt weeping, an uncommon musical experience that is typically viewed as very significant. And we know that for people who have the feeling of, of weeping or they actually weep for music, this is a very powerful experience for them in, uh, in music. So the stuff we're skipping, so what we're not going to talk about, and which we could talk about maybe in a question period or something, does sad music make listeners genuinely feel sad, or do they feel something different from that? So this is a, a deep question in the philosophy of aesthetics as to whether sad music, for example, a listener to sad music might recognize that the music is an apt portrayal or representation of sadness without necessarily making the listener feel sad. Um, but actually our research suggests that that's not the case at all, that people People listening to sad music genuinely do show not only the physiological symptoms of sadness, but the cognitive rumination and cognitive report that they're feeling sad. If sad music makes listeners feel sad, how are these feelings evoked? So there's lots of work that we've done related to that, but we won't be able to go over that tonight. And then what accounts for the physiological symptoms of sadness and grief? So when you think of, for example, in the case of grief, we make a distinction between sadness and grief. Sadness is a low arousal emotion. The heart rate is lower, respiration is shallow, person tends to have a loss of appetite and sleeps a lot and doesn't vocalize very much. In the state of grief, on the other hand, it's a high arousal emotion. The heart rate is high. Uh, the respiration is erratic and deep. And people wail and cry and sob and so forth when they do that. If you went to your doctor and you said, doctor, what's wrong with me? I have watery eyes. I have this nasal congestion. I have this lump in my throat <gasps> and this erratic breathing. Your doctor would immediately recognize that these are the symptoms of a systemic allergic response. So it's an interesting question. And in fact, if you've been crying for a long period of time, your face will become rather red and puffy. And the reason why it shows that inflammation is because of release of histamines. So it's actually a very deep physiological kinship with an allergy of which there's a beautiful story to tell what the relationship is between that and psychic pain, but we don't have time for that. <laughs> Why do people differ in their responsiveness to sad music? So another thing we know is that many pe some people are much more responsive and some people are not very responsive to this. And again, we don't have time to talk about that. Uh, what are the differences between sadness, grief, depression, and nostalgia? So people can feel nostalgia to music as well. And there's this wonderful concept in Brazil. They talk about saudade, which is subtly different than nostalgia, but that's another uh, different kind of emotion that people can feel related to this. So now the stuff we're not skipping. <laughs> so how can listening to sad music be enjoyable? And don't people try to avoid feelings of sadness? How can feeling bad lead to feeling good? Okay, so we can start here by talking about some work related to emotional contrast. And one of my former colleagues, Peter McGraw at, uh, at Ohio State University, did a very nice study a number of years ago where he just got amateur basketball players. And what he did was he set them up in a, in a, uh, on, a, on a court and just let them do shots. So we might be standing up, the, 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 the basket might be right here, and now we're gonna take a shot, we're gonna try to get it in. So before you take the shot, McGraw asked his basketball player, what do you think the probability is that you're going to make this shot? So you might be standing directly underneath the basket, and the basketball player says, ah, 95%, 99% chance, I'm getting this layup shot in. Okay, and then they take the shot. After you take the shot, on a scale from 0 to 10, tell me how you feel. Okay, so now, what happens, where 10 means feel fantastic and 0 means I feel terrible. So you take the layup shot, you've predicted that you've got a 99% chance of getting the layup shot, you get it in, how do you feel? That's maybe a 7 or something like that, I don't know what it is. You fail to get it in, what do you feel? Well, that's a zero. <laughs> that's a zero. You shouldn't, have, you shouldn't have missed that shot. Now what we do is we push you way back beyond the three-point line. And now you're going to take this lob and you think, what do you think the probability? Oh, you know, I got a, like a 2% chance of getting this in. You take your lob, you miss. How do you feel? Mm, maybe about a three or four, something like that. You get it in? Yes! That's the 10. So notice what happens here is that the feeling, the ultimate feeling you have is conditioned by the probability of the event happening so that there's some contrast here that plays an important role. Now what we know generally about emotion is that feelings are amplified by contrast. So consider you're, you've been asked into the boss's office. Okay, so you've been thinking, 
oh, I've been really working hard recently. I really worked hard on that particular contract and so forth. Maybe the boss is going to give me a raise. And you walk into the boss's office and the boss gives you a raise. You walk into the boss's office, scenario number two, the boss hands you a pink slip. How do you feel? Okay, now, scenario number three, the boss has called you into the office. Oh, I haven't been doing so well. You know, the economy really sucks. You know, oh boy, maybe I'm going to get laid off. You walk into the boss's office, boss hands you a pink slip. You, scenario number four, you walk into the boss's office, boss says, you've been doing great work, I'm giving you a raise. How do you feel? Okay. Notice that the objective consequence of these states is strong, and the affect associated with them is strongly conditioned by the contrast of what's what you expect to happen and what actually happens. Feeling bad and then feeling good is much more pleasant than just feeling good without the antecedent bad feelings. There's a role here for bad feelings. Okay, so <laughs> a good example of this is in the surprise party. When I was in sixth grade, we had, uh, uh, oh, I'm in Canada, I get to say grade six. Uh, when I was in grade six, um, uh, my teacher, Miss Bradley, we managed to get her to, she, she was invited to one of our students' uh, homes and uh, uh, ostensibly to have dinner with, the, with, with her parents and so on. But unbeknownst to her, the entire, uh, her entire sixth grade, uh, grade six class was, we were all hiding in the basement. And under some ruse or whatever, she managed to come down. Of course, it was completely dark, and she's fumbling around for the light switch. And she flicks on the switch, and we just let out the surprise! <laughs> it could not have been more satisfying for an 11-year-old boy's mind than to see her just about jump out of her skin. Her chin <laughs> dropped way down. Her eyes went completely bug-eyed and so forth. And so there was this moment of sheer and utter terror, <laughs> unmediated terror that's there. And now, of course, what happens is that's this limbic structure that's very fast. And then, of course, there's the occipital lobe back here, which is doing the visual stuff and pulling up. Oh, wait a minute here. Don't I recognize these faces? Oh, they're the children in my... Oh, Oh, this is a surprise. Oh, oh, and now there's this whole transformation that happens. Within 500 milliseconds, she goes from sheer and utter terror into complete happy celebration. And that's what this, the contrast that makes this such a powerful experience. So what about the pleasure of sadness? How can listening to music, which may bring you near tears, possibly be enjoyable? So first of all, I'm going to consider an example that's apart from the psychic pain we associate with sadness or grief and talk about physical pain. So suppose you were out in the forest and you got attacked by a bear. You know, the bear actually, you know, mangled your leg or something and now you're bleeding profusely here. What we know physiologically that would happen in your brain, a couple of things. First of all, there would be this enormous release of epinephrine. So you'd be, your heart would start to pound, you'd be sweating profusely, you'd be ready to run or fight because of that. The other thing that would happen is there, there would be a release of endorphins in the brain, and they would have two principal effects. One is it will have an analgesic effect, which means that it will dull the pain. The last thing you want to do when you've been attacked by a bear is to go, oh, that really hurts. <laughs> You know, and you just sort of writhe in pain there for a period of time. No, you need to have sufficient wherewithal to get up and run away or climb a tree or whatever it is to try to, to, try to get uh, away from, uh, from the bear. The other part, apart from the analgesic effect of the endorphins, they will have a hedonic effect, that is a pleasurable effect. In the, in the circumstance of interacting with a bear, it will mediate the sheer and utter terror and, all, and help you to, to, to be able to react in this particular case. Okay. Suppose we could convince your brain that you had been injured when in fact you hadn't been. So what would happen is you'd get the endorphin release with its analgesic effect and its hedonic effect, but with none of the pain. And the consequence of this is you'd be feeling pretty good. Okay, okay now let's change this and talk about a pleasurable sadness. When we are sad, there's a characteristic hormone called prolactin, which is released when sad. It's, it's evident even in the tears. It's released in such profuse quantities when you cry that you can measure the prolactin levels uh, in the tears, the psychic tears that are produced here. Now, prolactin is associated with lactation and pregnancy. When a woman is pregnant, she has about 100 times the normal levels of prolactin in her body. After she gives birth, it crashes to about 20 times the normal levels. But um, there's a, and normally, 
normally it's associated with lactation, but uh, there's another hormone, progesterone, which is also in large quantities. When a woman is pregnant, it's the presence of the progesterone which prevents the, lac the prolactin from actually causing the woman to lactate. Okay, um, prolactin is nature's consoling hormone. It produces a tranquilizing feel-good effect. So apart from the other things that people, if you look up in a medical dictionary, they'll all talk about lactation, but they won't talk about the fact that prolactin makes you feel good. In fact, prolactin, high prolactin levels during pregnancy, you'll find some women, not all women have this experience, but some women will say things like, oh, the best time in my life was when I was pregnant. And that's really the prolactin speaking, <laughs> especially <laughs> Especially in the last trimester when the woman is really big and she's having trouble sleeping and she has to pee all the time and all that, you know, it's the prolactin that makes all of that stuff tolerable. Now, at the point where you give birth, the prolactin levels all crash down to about 20 times normal and this change in prolactin level is implicated in what? Postpartum depression. So it's, it's a bit like having been on, Pro, uh, on Prozac for nine months and all of a sudden it's been withdrawn here. It's, there's some more complicated physiology than I've let on there, but that's you get the basic idea. Now, men also experience prolactin, and so apart from pregnancy, uh, prolactin is released following sex, and the amount of prolactin is correlated with judgments of sexual satisfaction and relaxation. Now, prolactin is released in sex not at orgasm. So it's not like the endorphins that are released at orgasm, it's the post part. It's the part of the, just the feeling, the kind of comfort and warm and, and, and just feeling tender and all of those other good things it, that prolactin has this big effect. So again, it's, it's implicated in this pleasurable experience that you have. Prolactin is released when we're sad and nursing mothers may experience involuntary lactation when watching a movie. I've had, uh, in fact, one, of, uh, one occasion it was actually a woman in, in uh, Hamilton who told me this story, but I've heard it from two different uh, uh, women. Uh, a circumstance where you've had a baby and maybe you've had, been at home for the last six months and finally you get to the point where the baby is mature enough that you can hire a babysitter. And so now you get to go off with your husband and do something. You get a good night out on the town. And so you decide to go to a movie. And your husband's going to be very helpful here. And so you get to go and see a chick flick. <laughs> Not, you know, 2012 or whatever it is that's, uh, right? So, and what happens when you go to see this? There's going to be a scene in the movie in which it's going to be a tearjerker and you have to, everybody's pulling out their hankies and so on. Well, you get women who have the experience that when the sadness comes from the movie, and what does the movie do? It really, when you get sad, it releases prolactin. And the next thing you know, the woman has to leave the movie. She can't stay there. Okay, so this, yeah, you can have these kinds of effects. So recall what I said earlier. Suppose we could convince your brain that you were physically injured without injuring you. We'd end up with the release of the endorphins with their analgesic and hedonic effects and you'd be feeling pretty good. Well, suppose we could convince your brain that you were psychically injured without actually injuring you. In this case, we would get the release of the prolactin with its consoling and hedonic effects without the accompanying pain. At the end of the day, it's just music, okay? So no psychic harm has been done. Your dog didn't die. You didn't lose your job. You didn't break up with your girlfriend. At the end of the day, everything is fine. So, what distinguishes pleasant sadness and pleasant crying from unpleasant sadness and unpleasant crying? And my conjecture is contrast of affect arising from cortical inhibition of stimulus-induced negative affect localized subcortically. <laughs> okay. So, okay. So basically, one part of your brain like the part of Ms. Bradley's brain that was just completely terrorized, these subcortical structures that are very quick to react and are always looking at the world through these very uh, uh, blue-tinted lenses, always expecting the worst. And then it's the cortical part that comes through and says, wait a minute here, this is actually a good thing. And now there's this huge inhibitory effect of this rather negative emotion, and the consequent contrast of this is very, very memorable. Okay, so the conclusion. The acoustic features of sad music, as we've seen, are very similar to the acoustic features of sad speech. Nominally, sad music appears to evoke something akin to real sadness in listeners. Not all listeners enjoy this feeling. Sad feelings are associated with the release of prolactin with its attendant consoling effects. The prolactin release is greatest when the music provokes tears 
or incipient tears. Music-induced crying is highly memorable and highly valued by listeners. So the pieces of music that bring you to tears are pieces for which you're going to have a very soft spot in your heart. People who experience music-induced weeping are more likely to be music lovers. We already know this through other research. Normally, we are saddened by events that objectively involve some sort of personal loss. However, it may be possible to fool the subcortical brain into a state of sham sadness in which there's ultimately nothing to feel sad about. So remember at the very beginning here, I said Oscar Wilde's statement. What did he say? After playing Chopin, I feel as if I had been weeping over sins I hadn't committed and mourning over tragedies that were not my own. In other words, he's reporting essentially this sham grief that we're talking about, this sham sadness, even though he recognizes cognitively that there's nothing wrong. The empirical research suggests that Wilde's description is entirely apt. The musically evoked sadness is ultimately recognized as groundless. Things aren't so bad after all. And this may explain why musical sadness may be enjoyable. And that's my story tonight. We do have one more piece of music, right? Is that right? Um, and we even have the, one of the composers here. This is by William Albright and Richard Bernie Smith. Is, which one are you? I'm Richard. Richard, thank you. So we get to play your piece. And what's also good about this is that this is a piece that's going to, uh, uh, it's going to involve all of us. So it's going to be a participatory thing. Uh, Laurel, do you want to describe this? Oh, Dave, David, do you want to describe this? What's going on? Because I'm also going to participate. Okay. So in your programs, you got... Oh, let me, before you just say, let me, <laughs> sorry to interrupt. Let, let me just say that this is not really a happy piece. I thought, you know, <laughs> we've, we've been hearing all sorts of sad music. It does leave you kind of bummed out listening to a bunch of sad music for some time, it, or at least it can have that effect. But it's much more uh, upbeat if we do that. But it's not really so much a happy piece as I think as a meditative, but still very positive piece. And I just want to leave you with one further uh, thing that we've been doing recent research on, which has to do with solos. So what we seem to have found is that a single instrument by itself, like a single flute or single violin, seems to have a sadder ethos to it than if you have a multiple flutes or multiple violins playing simultaneously. So one of the ways in which we can uh, kind of boost the experience of making it feel not quite so sad is by having everybody involved. Okay. So go ahead. Exactly. So the three snippets in your program are your options. Now, like uh, David said, it's meditative, so don't count, just whenever the spirit moves you. The only thing is that you need to sing them in order first, so the first one first, second one, and then the third, and then you can do whichever one comes to you. So um, we'll go through what they sound like, and then we'll start the piece. So the very first one is... Alleluia. Alleluia, 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 Alleluia. So I will start and then slowly you can filter in.
Richard Bernisco.